My name is Jonathan Karapetis. I'm the director of the Telethon Institute and I will be one of your speakers tonight as well. Uh, and this really is the second in this year's series of public seminars. It's a program that we're planning to, to run a fair, a fairly frequently uh, in the next few years to really bring some of the science to the community to answer questions, to get some of the experts talking to you about topics that interest you. And I'll come back to that a bit later. Is there a bit of feedback there? We, I'm sure we'll, we'll sort that out. Uh, can, uh, I also ask the people up the back, if you're having trouble hearing at any stage, just stick your hand up, wave, go like that, and we'll, we'll acknowledge you and we'll turn the volume up. Uh, it's great to see all of you here, and I do really want to welcome you to this. Um, this is uh, kind of part of the, the directions that we're setting for the Telethon Institute. The Institute's done a lot of this sort of thing in the past. We want to do even more. Uh, it's really important for us that, that we uh, play much more of a role as part of the community and that we make ourselves available, accessible, talking about the work we do, but also talking a bit more about the science that we're part of and the, the, uh, the, the world of science that we're connected to. Um, and obviously to bring that into a frame of mind that's relevant to individuals, to families. So uh, welcome and let's get stuck into it. We're going to talk about immunisation today. The topic was deliberately chosen as one that we know is always in people's minds. It's always something that parents wonder about, uh, that there's usually some media happening, some of it good, some of it bad, and there's always lots of questions that, that parents have when they go to the doctor and they want them uh, answered about immunisations, and that's fair enough. And what we want to do today is talk about some of the things that we know, address some of those specific questions. We are going to do it in a way that um, leaves plenty of time for those questions. Uh, we did want to make sure that whilst we had the experts here that we, we, uh, we tackled some of the issues that we think and we, from our experience we know that families uh, are wondering about. So we're going to go through the, some of the history of immunisation, some of the stories about how vaccines are made, how they're registered. Uh, we're going to address specifically the, in, the influenza vaccine issues that Western Australia has been um, very aware of over the last couple of years. And we're going to go through some of the questions that we know that parents often have. But uh, what we decided not to do was to right up front start to tell you about some of the new breakthroughs on the horizon, some of the research we're involved in. We're very happy to explore that in the question time if, if people would like. But we thought what we'd do is target the things that we suspect a lot of you in the audience are going to want to know about. Um, so we're going to do that with my illustrious panel. Uh, so let me just introduce myself. Um, other than knowing my name, you need to know I'm a paediatrician, an infectious diseases physician, and I have been working in public health, in research, in clinical practice related to infectious diseases and immunisation for a couple of decades. Uh, the next speaker will be Peter Richmond. Uh, Peter is a paediatrician and an immunologist and also a very active vaccine researcher. Um, and Chris Blythe, who is paediatrician and infectious diseases physician, head of infectious diseases at Princess Margaret, and also involved in research around vaccines and vaccine preventable diseases. Two other things you need to know about us. These two are both members of Australia's uh, National Immunisation Advisory Group to the, to the Commonwealth Government. It's called ATAGI, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, and both um, Peter and Chris sit on that group, uh, and so bring a lot of the um, exposure to those decision-making processes that occur at the, the national level. We all work, as well as working here at the Telethon Institute for Child Health Research, at Princess Margaret Hospital in clinical practice and at University of Western Australia um, for our academic appointments. So hopefully we bring a little bit of credibility to this discussion. Okay, let's get stuck into it. And the first question for a block of chocolate is to you. And employees of the Telethon Institute and Princess Margaret Hospital are not eligible. <laughs> Okay, with a show of hands, who can tell me where the term vaccine comes from? That's pretty good. All right, you get the chocolate. Well done. Oops, sorry about that. Well done. It is something to do with cows, and I'm going to tell you what to do with cows so that uh, you can rest easy. 
So, what, so let me just clarify. I'm going to go through some of the history of immunisation and talk a bit about the status here in Western Australia. Hand over to Peter, who I think I mentioned earlier was going to talk about vaccine development, registration, licensure processes, and Chris will address the flu issue and talk about some of those questions and answers. And like I say, we've got until 7.30, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. So the first thing to point out is that immunisation is nothing new. Um, this is a picture from, as you see, 1000 AD from China, and it shows a process known as variolation. Variola, referring to smallpox. Smallpox was a very common disease, and that's those spots all over that person's body. And it was a process that was actually relatively widely practiced in a range of countries around the world, where fluid was taken out of a smallpox blister and was then injected into the skin of another person with the aim of hoping to prevent disease in that person. It's actually a pretty efficient way of immunising people uh, because smallpox is usually spread through the air, through people coughing and breathing in droplets that are infected with virus. And that's a nasty way to get smallpox. If you get it that way, you're much more likely to get very sick and much more likely to die. And it's got a very high mortality rate, 40 to 60% of people who got smallpox in those days died. Whereas if you take the virus and inject it directly into the skin, it's much less likely to cause severe disease and much more likely to make, like, make you immune, which is great. Unfortunately, about two to five percent of people who were injected this way died themselves from the smallpox. So it didn't get a lot of good press. It was, um, it was widely ridiculed, but still, as you can imagine, widely practiced because smallpox was a big deal in those days. And indeed, it was imported into the United Kingdom sometime in the 1700s. And then along came Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner is widely considered to be the father of vaccines, but as I, as I sort of pointed out, he wasn't the first person to do it. Um, indeed, he probably wasn't the first person to do this, but he was the first person to do it in a scientific way and, and write, up, write it up as a paper. So in 1796, Edward Jenner, noting that milkmaids had extremely good skin. Uh, in turn, the term milkmaid skin was widely used to give that, that to talk about that uh, lovely complexion, the kind of supermodel complexion. Noting that they, that, that was as a result of never getting smallpox and therefore not getting scars all over their face, um, wondered whether in fact it was because milkmaids got a disease called cowpox uh, that they got from cows. And the cowpox was a relatively mild disease, mainly caused blisters on the hands and feet and in turns out is closely related to the smallpox virus. And so Jenner, uh, and this picture depicts him, taking, he's taken the um, fluid from a cowpox blister on a milkmaid and injected it into the arms of an eight-year-old boy. And then subsequently, sometime later, he then gave this boy, challenged this boy with the fluid from a smallpox blister. And the boy did not get disease and the boy was protected and hence modern immunisation was born. In fact, Jenna had a lot of trouble getting this published. The Royal Society didn't want to publish it. I don't think because of the ethical issues. You couldn't do that these days because of the ethical issues, but more because they just didn't believe it. But it turned out that he was right. Um, fast forward 100 years to Louis Pasteur, and by that stage, Pasteur is considered to be the father of modern immunisation practice. Pasteur was the one who really refined the, the process of developing vaccines, testing them, of taking virus and deactivating and killing it. He developed rabies vaccine, and, and this is a, a medal that depicts um, a young boy whose name is there. there go, Joseph Meister. Joseph Meister um, was a boy who was attacked by a rabid dog was given the rabies vaccine that Pasteur had developed and was protected from rabies. Well, he didn't get rabies. We don't know if he was protected. Not everyone who gets bitten by a rabid dog is protected, but we do know that the vaccine works. And Pasteur was really the one who developed the processes that have become um, the immunisation service that we offer today. That's all I'm gonna talk about history. I wanna to move to the current day. What we now have is a process where we have a range of vaccines that, as you all know, we give to children all over the world. We give them much better to children in wealthy countries than we do in poor countries. But these vaccines are there to protect against disease. And if there's one message we want to get across to you today is that vaccines are there to save children's lives. They're not there just as part of the routine part of growing up. 
They are there to save children's lives because we are protecting against very severe diseases. So UNICEF, this was a couple of years ago, UNICEF went through the process of trying to estimate if we didn't have these vaccines, how many people would be dying today. And if you look through the prevented column, smallpox. Smallpox is the one disease we've managed to eradicate through immunisation. So we no longer need to use it because the disease doesn't exist anymore. It's estimated that 5 million deaths a year have been prevented as a result. If you go down to diphtheria, 200,000, whooping cough, 630,000, measles, 1.6 million. So we're not talking small numbers. Millions of cases of deaths and severe disease are now being prevented thanks to vaccines. And it's easy in a place like Perth, where life is pretty good, where most people don't get all that sick from nasty infectious diseases to think, hey, it's okay, that was something that happened yesterday. But we don't often find people who are in their 60s who think that way, because people in their 60s lived through epidemics of these diseases, epidemics of measles, of, of whooping cough, of diphtheria. These are diseases that thanks to vaccines we're managing to get on top of. But as we'll talk about in this, in this uh, presentation, they are not diseases that have disappeared. There's only one that has disappeared. The rest are still around and there is a very real risk and the real risk is played out of these diseases coming back. And in particular of individual children being susceptible to these diseases, dying from them, getting brain damage. And that's what we want to talk about today. So this is the Australian data. Now this is from a booklet that is out there. You're all welcome to take it. You can download it from the web. It was put out early this year by the Australian Academy of Science, Australia's most august scientific body. And it's the science of immunization questions and answers. It's a fantastic book. So a lot of the things that you won't, we won't be able to go into today, I, I encourage you to have a read because it will answer a lot of your questions. And this summarizes some of the data in Australia about what has happened with immunisation over time and with vaccine preventable diseases. So if you, these are deaths, deaths due to diphtheria on the left, before immunisation 4,000 deaths a year, now no deaths a year. Pertussis, 1,500 deaths a year and now we do actually still see some deaths. Uh, so 17 as you see in that group there and, and every so often it, it, it rears its ugly head again. Tetanus, 625 deaths a year, now none. Or well, seven, there we go. Polio, 123, and measles, 146. So these are the numbers of cases, people, children, who are not dying these days thanks to vaccines. But I wanted to give you a bit of a personal perspective, which is something that's, that's uh, very important to me. Um, I consider myself a very lucky person because I've seen the eradication of a disease myself. <coughs> a lot of people in this audience will have seen eradications of disease. You may not have known it at the time. Um, I saw this. So 1892, we, uh, a, a nasty, nasty bacterium known as Haemophilus influenzae, or Hib, was first described. Now, this bug can infect your bloodstream, can cause meningitis, can cause another disease I'll tell you about in a second. <coughs> and it was the most frequent cause of serious life-threatening infection in children under five in Australia up until the mid-90s. So, you know, those of us who trained in those days knew all about this bug, we saw it all the time. And it caused horrendous meningitis. There's the brain of a child who died with meningitis that killed people that caused brain damage. And as you'll see, in 1993, the vaccine was introduced in Australia. What I wanna do now is just show you a video. This is a boy who came into the emergency department incredibly sick. He is, looks like he's trying to fall asleep. In fact, that's because his oxygen level in his blood is incredibly low, and in fact, his airway is about to obstruct. He's got a disease called epiglottitis. This is a disease of any, when I trained, that filled young paediatric trainees with dread. When you worked in the emergency department, you hoped like hell that that sort of child didn't walk in your emergency department. Because if they did, you knew that there was a serious chance of that child dying right in front of you. 
Why? This is the airway of a normal child. So what you see there, that little hole in the middle, that's the airway, the, the windpipe, the opening to the windpipe. That white ring around it is what's called the epiglottis. That's the normal, basically, the fo vocal cords, the bit that surrounds the opening to the airway. That's what it should look like. In a child with this disease, epiglottitis, the bacteria infects, for some reason, that particular part of the airway. And it forms this big, swollen, cherry red lump. And the danger is that, look at the size of that airway. This thing can easily block off the airway. Suddenly, there's no way for air to get into the lungs. We also know that this child, you'll notice there's no other sound other than his breathing, his snoring sound, he's drooling, he's got this snoring sound, there's no other sound. Why? Because I can describe to you what's happening around him right now. Controlled panic. Because this is an urgent, life-threatening situation, but we also know that any stress, any upset, can cause that thing to swell and block off the airway. So the nurses and the doctors are trying to explain to the parents that this is really urgent, we're trying to get someone in to help, but we just have to be very calm. Very hard thing to tell the parent, because any upset, any loud noises, anything, if the child starts crying, he could obstruct his airway. Meanwhile, someone's on the phone to the anaesthetist saying, get down here, because the life-threatening, the life-saving procedure will be to put a wind, uh, a tube, as you see on that side, into the air, airway to stop the possibility of that, that thing obstructing. And I can tell you that everyone is just on tenterhooks. What you're hoping also is that the anaesthetist who walks through the door is the best anaesthetist you've got because you only get one shot with this one. You've got to slowly put the child to sleep. You've got to have one go at getting that windpipe in because if you tickle that thing, it'll swell up like a cherry and block off. And there are people walking around today with scars right here from the urgent tracheostomy that's had to be done because that's the only way to get their airway in. And there are people who are in coffins because that couldn't be done in time. And I, and I can tell you, I'm just it's going through my head right now, that sense of euphoria when the anaesthetist is there, he's got the tube in, the, the kid goes, <sighs> it's just like there's high fives everywhere and you can't imagine, imagine it. But this, this is a disease that does not exist in this country anymore. This is what happened with Haemophilus. So 500 cases a year, meningitis, epiglottitis, life-threatening diseases down to hardly any in no time, thanks to a vaccine. I've, I've seen this, I've lived through this. We, don't, we hardly ever see Haemophilus. Now, it's still there, it hasn't gone away, and it does come back, and it has come back if you're not careful with the immunizations. So it hasn't disappeared, but we've got on top of this disease. So this is the story of immunization that you need to know. So we're not wandering around looking for kids who are mistaking us for ice cream vans and trying to immunize them. We're doing it for a reason. Why are we doing it for a reason? Well, because we are protecting kids. This is the Western Australian data. This is what we do for vaccine coverage in this state. Um, and it's actually pretty good. So contrary to what you might have heard, things are not getting worse in this state. Um, they're not getting as uh, much better as we'd like, but they're, they're kind of flatlining. So if you'll see, these are the proportion of kids who are fully immunized at different age groups. And so it's about 90% for most of the um, young kids. You'll see we've actually, if anything, improved over the years for the older kids, the toddlers, the, the five-year-olds, in fact, that we're all getting to about 90%. So that's pretty good. The unfortunate point is there's still 10% of kids who are not protected, and that actually raises risk not only to those kids, but to other kids. And the other sad part of it is that I haven't shown you the data from the other states. Western Australia, unfortunately, does the worst of any state. And so we need to work on making this better. But we do have most kids protected, and that's a really important thing for you also to know. But what happens if we don't keep this up? This is what happens. This is right now in the United Kingdom, measles. Measles rate, immunisation rates have dropped too far in the United Kingdom, and they have dropped too far in certain pockets. So those statewide data, they hide 
the reality that there are some parts and there are some risk groups that don't get enough immunizations. In Western Australia, for example, we know there are some regions where the uptake rate is lower. We know there are some populations like Aboriginal kids, especially in the urban settings, who don't get their vaccines as well as they should. In the United Kingdom, they have seen a surge in measles cases in 2012. And if you'll see on that left, it's, pre it's predominantly in North and in Wales. And deaths are occurring. And so there's a very active program to catch people up with measles vaccines. So if we drop our guard, this does happen. Things come back. And in Western Australia, we've been through this before and we need to keep alert. So this is an, an ad from, I think it's about 20 years ago. I'm not feeling very well. Don't be sad, baby. It's only measles. Measles is not just one of those things kids get. It's a serious disease. One in 15 children with measles needs hospital care. One in a thousand develops a brain infection. And one in 5,000 dies. Don't wait until it's too late. Immunize against measles now. It's sure, it's safe, and it's up to you. So it's something that it keeps coming back and we need to keep vigilant and we need, above all, to tell the truth. What we have on our side and what we're trying to get across tonight is the facts and we're willing to base, the, base everything on the facts and that's what we're on about tonight. So with that, what I'm going to do now is hand over to Peter Richmond who's going to tell you a little bit more about how vaccines are made and registered. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jonathan, for that introduction. And, um, it's pleasing to see so many um, people here to um, hear about immunisation and I guess particularly from, as, uh, from a research perspective, as a research institute, I think it's really important that people understand um, how seriously we take this responsibility to make sure we understand what vaccines are doing, how they work, how can we have the best vaccines and how can we make sure they're safe and, and I think that's really important. Um, so I'd just like to cover a couple of things. First of all, give my sort of personal perspective on immunisation and vaccine preventable diseases and why I got involved in the first place. Um, talk about why we particularly focus on infants because um, as we've seen a couple around here, they are uh, always very vulnerable and as new parents, I think there is uh, nothing else that parents lie awake worrying more about is how do we keep my you know, newborn infant safe and well? And immunisation is one of the best things that you can do for that. I'll then talk a little bit about how vaccines develop, because obviously if we are going to be giving these things to our children and to our um, populations, and increasingly vaccines are being developed for adults as well, we need to understand how, how they've got there and what, what is happening and what is happening with the vaccines we're using now. And can we be reassured that, that we are taking this safe, uh, seriously and, and monitoring the safety and that they work? There's no point giving vaccines if they don't work. Um, and then uh, I'll hand over to Chris who will talk a little bit more about the example of flu and, and the sort of work we're doing with that. So um, this is a story in the 60s of a, of a two-year-old child who grew up in the southwest who presented with a 48-hour history of fever and cough. His mum was a nurse, said uh, he looks pretty sick, I'm going to take him to Bustle Road Hospital, it was about 40 kilometre drive away. Um, and Kevin Cullen, who was the GP, said I think this child's got pneumococcal pneumonia. Uh, and treated him with penicillin and he got better. And of course you may see some resemblance because that was me. <laughs> 30 years later I'm working as a registrar in the Kimberley. I've been posted to work in Derby Hospital. I'm the only person with paediatric experience up there and there's a call from the RFDS about a child they're evacuating to, for me to go out to the airport to meet. And the story was they live on a remote station. They'd had a similar fever and cough for two days. It was difficult. There was no medical access there. Um, Mum thought he'd probably get better. He just had a bit of a virus. But he deteriorated. He got increasingly lethargic, started vomiting, didn't respond. Um, they got the station uh, owners to call the RFDS. The child was unconscious and he died in the hospital whilst we were trying to resuscitate him. A post-mortem showed that he started off with the same disease that I did, but then developed meningitis and didn't recover. And part of the beauty of immunisation is that we don't have to deal with either of these cases if we can prevent them with vaccination. And we don't have to worry about getting that urgent medical care because the disease is prevented. And I, and I think that's really important as paediatricians, we're now uh, recognising parents do want to do what's in the best interest of their children. It's difficult to know when is it 
just a virus that doesn't need any treatment and will get better with its own, and when is it a serious infection that needs emergency treatment? And so I think the more we can do to take those very serious infections out of the equation, the better everyone will be able to sleep at night. And so that's really, that's when I said, actually, I think I want to do something about this and got involved in immunisation. So when we're thinking about a, a, a vaccine to develop, we have to sort of know a bit about the disease, how common is it, is it worthwhile developing a vaccine for it? Um, so we have to have good surveillance for infectious diseases. And in Australia, we're very lucky. We have one of the best surveillance for infectious diseases in the world from a national perspective. We need to understand how it occurs. How do we spread it? What, what makes somebody vulnerable? What protects us from disease so that we don't get the disease if we're exposed to it, a la the, the uh, protection of the um, boy from smallpox via cowpox vaccination. So we under need to understand those uh, mechanisms of protection. Um, and clearly before we start trying, trying it in human trials, we need to understand, well, does it really work in an animal model? Are we likely? Clinical trials are extremely expensive and won't be embarked on unless there's good proof of principle in, in an in a animal model, which is generally mice. But I think as we know, we're, humans are not mice and it's very difficult to sometimes interpret what we find in mice studies and whether or not that will apply to humans. And I think unfortunately probably there's a lot of good vac potential vaccines out there that haven't been trialled because they don't work so well in mice. But most of the diseases we worry about aren't natural diseases of mice and so we have to be careful about drawing those conclusions. So it's really important that uh, for important diseases we're able to uh, put them into clinical trials as soon as possible. My particular interest in immunisation verse first got started by meningococcal disease. This is a, a serious infection that can cause both meningitis and blood poisoning or septicemia and is very rapidly progressive. So you can be mildly unwell at breakfast and be uh, almost dead by, by tea time. So it can be very rapidly uh, progressive and the early signs are nonspecific. Unlike some of the diseases we vaccinate, again, it also affects adolescents and young adults. And I think that's one of the reasons the public awareness for meningococcal disease is so high, because people know what these teenagers and adolescents were like before they developed the disease. And so any long-term side effect or, or deaths are, are taken much more um, seriously, I think, and, and gain more publicity, as well as the potential for outbreaks. And importantly, early research that was done in the late 60s was able to show that we understand that antibodies circulating in our blood protect us against disease. So this was very useful when we were starting to develop vaccines to work out, well, would we expect these um, vaccines to work? But why do we vaccinate infants? They're so vulnerable, can't we just wait till they're a bit older and their immune system's a bit stronger um, and, and then they'll be able to cope with it much better? That's a very common question that um, parents will put to us. Well, one of the reasons is when babies are first born, they get protective antibodies from their mothers. They get passed through the placenta. Some babies, like premature infants, don't get as much antibody from their mothers, and so they're particularly vulnerable to infectious diseases. And we can see here that between the ages of three months and a year, we are at babies have their lowest level of protective antibodies. This is total antibody levels in the blood, but for any disease we want to talk about, we see a similar pattern of dropping um, rates of antibodies to that specific um, bacteria or virus during that first year of life. And the other problem is the immune system is not as quick to switch on in that first year of life. The sort of immune systems are still developing. And so this combination of lack of protective antibodies and a relatively immature immune system means that infants and young children are particularly susceptible to diseases. But as we know, as in the case of meningococcal disease, um, older children and adults can also be susceptible, depending on how, how frequently you can generate immunity in a population. So this is why um, it's very important that we're able to protect infants and get them up to those adult antibody levels um, as quickly as possible. And fortunately we know that although the immune system may be slow to switch on with some infections, in fact we can vaccinate babies as early the first week of life and we get good antibody responses. We have a vaccine, hepatitis B vaccine, that has been shown to protect infants when given to newborns, when their mums are also infected with hepatitis B. We've done research here and in Papua New Guinea to show that other vaccines like pneumococcal vaccines and currently doing a study of a whooping cough vaccine to see whether also that can be given to newborn babies to protect them very early on. And certainly the evidence to date is, is that that does appear to be the case.
So the immune system is able to turn on if you give it the right signal. So this is very promising. And certainly starting at two months of age, we, we have seen for all the, all the vaccines that we currently use in infants, that they are able to elicit antibody responses, which are protective. But this sometimes needs two or three doses of the vaccines to do that. And that's why our schedule starts with vaccinations at two, four and six months of age. And, and similar, similar vaccination schedules are used across the world. In very poor developing countries, the burden of infectious diseases is so high, they actually start vaccinating at six weeks of immunisation and, and give the second and third doses at 10 and 14 weeks. So they're completely vaccinated by three months of age. So this concern that we have about vaccines not working when we give it to young infants is, is simply not true. So we, we've got our vaccine, we're going to test it. How do we do it? Well, the first thing to do is to make sure that it is safe in adults, because we can't necessarily rely on those studies in mice and other animals. Um, and so we generally have a small number of healthy adult volunteers. Um, we want to show that it's safe. We, make, we measure a, a large number of both uh, clinical symptoms, so such as local reactions, flu-like symptoms, um, but we also measure laboratory markers of safety, so things like liver function tests and blood counts. Um, and in addition to that, we want to provide a proof of concept. So it actually looks as though people do respond well to this vaccine. And this is an example of a study that we were involved in about five years ago that was published last year of a new meningococcal B vaccine. So we're able to show that it was safe and that the adults who received the vaccine required either two or three doses shown here in these um, uh, maroon and dark purple bars were able to respond to a wide variety of group B meningococcal strains for which we currently don't have a licensed vaccine. So this was proof of principle enough for the, the um, company that's developing the vaccine and, and vaccines are developed by pharmaceutical companies so they do have shareholders and they do want to sell their product at the end of the day. And so, but, but it, a vaccine to go from a phase one trial to being licensed is in the order of somewhere of around $100 million to develop. So this is a very expensive business. And so, um, but what's important is they were able to say, yes, this looks good for us and we're able to take this vaccine to the next step. And that we've now entered subsequent trials with this vaccine in um, adolescents and younger children. So this is the next stage of research. And again, we've been involved in a number of studies with different vaccines over the years. And this is what's called a phase two study. And this is when we start to look at it in the infants or young children, or in the case of some other vaccines, maybe in, in older adults, if that's what the vaccine is developed for. So this is the target population. And generally what we want to do is to compare it to a current vaccine that we know is safe, um, so we can compare the sorts of side effects we might be able to see to say that this is okay. And again, this is a very important part of the process. The other thing we want to show is, yeah, it's actually going to work in this population. So we, are, we have to measure immune responses to the um, bacteria or the virus that we're trying to prevent. Um, and this is important. We'll be able to assess the common sorts of reactions that we might get, usually reactions at an injection site if it's an injectable vaccine, um, but also the sorts of numbers of children that might expect to get fevers or feel a bit unwell as the immune system is stimulated to mount that protective response. But also we want to know how much do we need to give. So we have to look at a number of different doses of the vaccines that we might give. So how much do um, babies or young children need to respond to the vaccine? And we also might look and see, do we need something to enhance that immune response? And so this is something that's called adjuvants. And so this is something that's not necessarily from the bacteria or the virus that we, the vaccine has been developed against, but we know that it can enhance the quality of the antibody response that we make. And so this is something that people sometimes ask about and alum is a adjuvant that's used in a lot of vac vaccines we currently use. It's in fact been around since 1925. So we have a long history of use of this um, adjuvant in our vaccines and what it's shown to do is to increase both the height of the antibody response and how long it lasts for. So to improve the protection given by vaccines. It does tend to be associated with slightly more um, reactions at, at the site of injection where the immune system is being stimulated. Um, but for some very difficult diseases, we're now entering another phase of looking at very new um, adjuvants to improve the immune response for things like malaria, tuberculosis and HIV. And we're certainly learning a lot more about the immune system as we do this. So, so these are very important studies and again, generally are the 
go, no go for a vaccine that's going to be licensed. But once, once these studies have been done and we've got an optimal formulation and we know that the age group is going to respond to it, we enter much larger studies. And this is an example of a phase two study where we're looking at combining two current vaccines. So we've just heard from Jonathan about the Hib vaccine that's eradicated epiglottitis and meningitis, and we give that to infants and also a booster at 12 months of age and the meningococcal C vaccine that we give to toddlers at 12 months of age. And sometimes parents complain that they're getting too many injections because they also get MMR at 12 months of age. So that's three injections. So this vaccine's been combined to see if we can see how well it works. So we can see here that the combined vaccine is there in the orange um, and the separate vaccine, so two different injections given separately as shown in blue. And you can see that the um, orange line is as good as, in terms of the number of children protected, as the blue line over a three year period. So not only are we looking at it initially when we receive the vaccine, but we're also following these children up. And we're now up to the fifth year of follow up for these children. So we're also looking at long term vaccine safety. So these are very important um, when we start to talk to parents about this new vaccine. And this one's going to be introduced onto our schedule um, later this year, towards the end of um, 2013. So, th so this is the sort of research that needs to be done to make sure these vaccines are going to work, and particularly when we start to, to combine different vaccines, such as the ones we currently use in, in our uh, in immunisation schedule. But these, these studies are pretty detailed. This is an example of, of a, a study we did in adolescence. Um, parents have to agree, as do the um, teenagers. They have to sign up for um, 13 months of the study with six visits. They have three doses of this vaccine, or the control, because we have to compare it to a currently licensed vaccine. They had to have five blood tests to check the immune response to all these different group B strains. They had a diary that they filled out every night um, for two weeks. They kept some specific signs on symptoms that we sometimes see with vaccines such as headache, vomiting or, or reactions at the injection site. Um, but also the parents kept, kept a record of any visits they had and particularly any hospitalisations. And this continued for six months after the study had finished. So this was a really um, detailed follow-up to get the most amount of safety information that we could about this vaccine. Um, and when you ask the children, why did you sign up to this? They said, we want to help other people. And this has been a critical part of the success of the research, I think, is the willingness of the public to um, take part in this essential research that we need if we're going to get these um, vaccines licensed and, and into use in preventing disease. And then this is the final stage before a vaccine gets licensed, phase three studies. So these are very large studies, up to 70,000 um, uh, people involved in, in, the, in the trials um, and assesses how protective a vaccine is and also makes sure that there's no rare reactions that um, uh, you might see in a very large population. And we also do other things that enable us to understand better um, how we get protection from disease um, and how we might monitor the that we're making the same uh, effective batches of vaccine subsequently. And so we look at different batches in these very large studies. So this is very important. And these are some examples of um, vaccines that we studied. A cervical cancer vaccine um, in young women, looking at almost 20,000 young women over a four year period to show how well um, this particular vaccine, Cervix, it's not the one we use in Australia, but is used in the United Kingdom, um, uh, protects and showed very high levels of protection with no safety concerns. And we can say that because it's been studied in 20,000 young women. We did a very large study at um, Australia-wide and including New Zealand looking at a um, seasonal influenza vaccine made, made by CSL. And again, no safety concerns in adult and was highly effective in preventing influenza. And we're currently doing a study with this meningococcal B vaccine that I've been showing as we go along that's involving um, 6, 000, almost 6,000 teenagers and young adults. And for any of those in, within that age group who have children in that age group, we're still looking for some new people. So contact us if, you, if you're interested. So you can see that before we get a vaccine license, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Once the, all that information from those studies has been put together, it's considered by expert reviewers. Um, ATAGI, the committee that Chris and I sit on, have working groups that look at all the information, how are we going to use this vaccine, and then it becomes licensed. And this is how the West Australian might take a view of a new vaccine for preventing cervical cancer. You may sometimes get the wrong impression. But vaccines are important news. 
we're vaccinating 90% of our population, as Jonathan said. So 90% of the readers are, have got an interest in vaccines. And so stories will get picked up very quickly, whether they're positive or negative. Um, and, and sometimes the sub-editor who makes the headlines may not actually match the, the reality of the um, article about it. So, so then, then the public has to decide, and the government, are we, wanting, are we willing to pay for these vaccines? Um, and we now have a very clear process for doing that that compares vaccines to all the other drugs that the government subsidises through our health system, through the pharmaceutical benefits um, system. So we now have to show that it's actually cost effective. It's not just that this is a good vaccine, this has to s save lives at a certain cost. So, so Australia now has one of the, I think, tightest regulations about demonstrating how cost-effective vaccines are. Clearly you can still buy it privately after it's been licensed, but it won't be provided on our national program unless it's able to be cost-effective. So the vaccine's licensed, it's deemed to be cost-effective and it's introduced. So what do we do then? Uh, well, we still need to look for very, very rare adverse events. Even looking at 100,000 children is not enough to uh, look for very rare events sometimes. So it's important that we have ongoing safety surveillance and the Therapeutics Goods Administration has been responsible for this, but um, as Chris will talk about, we now have much more detailed surveillance to look for problems after vaccines. And now actually has a specific part of the TGA that is able to look at vaccine safety alone. And so there's a committee that's just been set up for this. It also reflects the real life use of vaccines. It's not in a controlled clinical trial, it's been given to lots of different people um, and uh, GPs may not always have um, as uh, uh, good storage of vaccines. So this really reflects, does the vaccine still really work? So is it still effective? Do we know that it's effective? Will the, will the strains of the bugs change that can cause disease like we see with influenza every year? And we've seen with some other uh, examples. But really importantly, we have to be able to investigate um, concerns that might be raised after introduction of vaccines. Um, and we're gi when we're giving vaccines to 90% of the population, 90% of bad things, other than the diseases that that vaccine is preventing, will happen in that population. So we have to sort out, is this related or not, ev even if it um, potentially um, has been seen to be thought by the parents or, or the providers to, to be associated with that. So that requires very detailed and careful analysis. This is an example of looking at how well a vaccine works. Jonathan's showed the story of Hib vaccine. Here we can see meningococcal disease, serogroup C disease. In um, 2003, we had more than 200 cases of meningococcal C disease with about 10, over 10% 10 of those people getting the disease dying. So about 30 deaths a year. The vaccine was introduced for toddlers and for children with a catch up to 18 years. And you can see that by 2007, we'd had a major impact on disease um, with more than 90% reduction, not just in those children that were vaccinated, but in infants too young to be vaccinated and adults too old to be vaccinated. Why is that? Well, we've stopped this disease spreading within our community. And this is what we talk about herd immunity. And what's the magic cutoff figure for most diseases to get good herd immunity? It's that 90%. So at the moment, 90% is great, but it would be even better if you could get above it because that will enhance the herd immunity. And that will protect people who choose not to immunise their children. So a lot of people say, well, my child's never been vaccinated and they haven't got a disease. Well, that's because we have herd immunity because 90% of the population is getting vaccinated. And obviously we also see a reduction in deaths when we're not getting the cases of infection. This is another example. Rotavirus is the most, was the most common cause of severe gastroenteritis, so diarrhoea and vomiting in children. Prior to the introduction of vaccine, we had these annual winter epidemics of disease. Children with very severe vomiting, severe diarrhoea, unwell for five to seven days, 10,000 hospitalizations a year. In uh, July 2007, just before winter, um, the vaccine was introduced for infants and we can see even in the first winter there was a reduction in the number of cases of rotavirus vaccination. And in the ensuing two years there was even further reductions. So that there's been overall a 70% decrease, 7,000 less hospitalisations due to this infection in young children each year. And again, not just children vaccinated, but also those too old to be part of the vaccination as part of this herd immunity. So this is one of the benefits of having these high rates of vaccination in Australia. Generally, we are much better than places like the United States at getting high levels of courage very quickly. So we get the benefits sooner. Vaccine safety is not something new that we worry about. 
This was just after Edward Jenner had started to introduce the smallpox vaccine, the cowpox vaccine in the United Kingdom. And this is a cartoon at that time of the sort of side effects people were worried about. If you're giving a bit of cowpox, you might have an unexpected growth that would appear. So, so it is important that we think about what are the public worried about, and that's one of the reasons for having tonight's meeting, and, and how can we address those issues? Are we doing the research already, or is there a new piece of research we have to do? And we need to make sure everyone knows about that. So hopefully by the end of the tonight, you will be aware that immunisation is one of the most effective things we can do for our children, and increasingly for adults. That vaccines are extensively studied before, before they're being used in the general population, including for uh, studies in Australia. Um, we need to maintain high coverage, and Jonathan's given the example of measles. The recent whooping cough epidemic is a good example of a, vac of a va vaccine preventable disease that needs ongoing high coverage in different age groups. Um, but we do have to have good surveillance and, and for both disease and for vaccine safety. Um, and we need to address public concerns. And I think we need to get better at pro providing information and being able to deal with people who feel they have had problems with the vaccine. And, and that's something that Chris will uh, talk a bit more about. And importantly, I think the, we need ongoing investment in vaccines and related research. As a, as a country, we need to value vaccines and what they can do for our population. So I'll finish there and then hand over to Chris um, to talk about um, when things don't go so well with vaccines. I was also, I don't have a personal vaccine story or a personal vaccine preventable disease story like Peter, but I have a number of stories of having to sit there with families uh, and being asked the question, well, what could have I done to avoid this? And unfortunately, the answer following, well, this disease is vaccine preventable. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that situation uh, didn't occur in this situation. And it's quite difficult to have to give that information to families. But on another note, it's certainly very hard to talk about vaccine safety as well. In 2010, really, uh, Western Australia woke up to really uh, an, evolving, uh, an evolving situation that really has uh, changed the way we do things. You've seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of reports of things such as this in the press. So I'm gonna take you through the influenza story, some information about why we started in, uh, immunising against influenza in Western Australia and what we've done as a subsequent to this. So why do we Im try to immunise young children against influenza? Well, nearly, the figures are there, so 7,000 children under the age of five are diagnosed with influenza each year. In Australia, the under fives are the age group most at risk of influenza. People think about flu in the elderly, you know, it's a, you know, the elderly gentleman's best friend, that sort of stuff, but really it's the young children who are most likely to be present to hospital. And of those young children who present to hospital, nearly 20%, nearly one in five children are admitted to hospital. Many are admitted to hospital for a prolonged period of time, Many end up in the intensive care unit and each year we end up with some influenza related deaths in young children. And it's really with those deaths that this story starts. This is in 2007 and we had three unexpected influenza related deaths um, in mid 2007 and really the West Australian Health Authorities thought well can we do, do something better in Western Australia to try and prevent influenza related deaths. And so we started a state-based influenza vaccination program. The only state in Australia to run its own influenza vaccination program for well children six months to five years. And in looking at the data that emerged from this study, and we've really enrolled in the study, nearly two and a half thousand children, the vaccination protects three out of four children from getting influenza. So significantly less children who are vaccinated present Princess Margaret Hospital if they've received a vaccination compared to those who haven't. But you can't run a vaccination program if you're not comfortable with the vaccine and really that's what occurred in 2010. These are data that we've collected from 2010. So of children who are administered a CSL flu vax or a flu vax junior which was one of two preparations we used that year over 50% of children had high temperatures, unacceptable. Nearly 20% of children, parents reported significant vomiting, again, unacceptable, and about one in 100 children who received that vaccination had a febrile convulsion. 
again, cannot accept that as far as a vaccination program. What hasn't made through to the press, there are other vaccinations that were given that year. It was an alternative vaccination given and really in looking at our data, the amount of children who developed a temperature, much lower, much lower rates of vomiting and no febrile convulsions as a result of the alternative product in 2010. So clearly adverse events were occurring from one vaccination at a rate that no health professional would accept and something that we couldn't tolerate and the vaccination program was stopped. So why? There's been a number of investigations into why this occurred and really in short the summary is that the vaccination produced by CSL is different than the other vaccinations. It's less split, it's got more virus in it and really that leads to a much more reactive vaccine and more side effects. Clearly side effects of a level that's beyond what we'd normally accept. And so as a result of that nationally, the CSL influenza vaccine has been, uh, we're not to give it to children under the age of five. And in Western Australia, we really have taken this stance that we do not want to use a CSL product in any child. But these adverse events made us really look at what we're doing in this state. Clearly, we need to be on the ball as far as vaccine safety. If we're going to have confidence in our vaccination program, we need to make sure that this does not occur again. So what have we done? Well, firstly, we've set an overarching com uh, committee to oversee vaccine safety across the state. We've set up the West Australian Vaccine Safety Surveillance System. So this is a system which allows you the general public or any immunisation provider to log any adverse events in real time and they're reviewed the next working day and any adverse event is sent off to a health professional, namely Manny Peter or myself, to review and any child with a significant adverse event or even it's a suspected adverse event can be reviewed quickly. In other words, we can keep a very close eye on what's happening. We've established adverse events clinic at Princess Margaret Hospital, but also for adults at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. So there's now the opportunity for anyone who has or suspects they have an adverse event to be reviewed quickly and for the information to be obtained and to be sorted. Importantly, we are now actively monitoring for unexpected events, not only with influenza, but any newly introduced vaccine. And this is happening at a state level, but also a national level. Peter talked about the new committee that's forming nationally to specifically monitor vaccine safety and this will specifically occur following the introduction of a new vaccine. We've got some new vaccines coming on board this year and we're in the planning phase of how do we monitor this? How do we keep a very close eye so when we introduce this vaccine we can be onto it? And the other thing that's really been established is clear communication lines between states and the Commonwealth so that not only are we looking at the West Australian population, but we can look at the national population. A signal that occurs in Queensland will be known in Western Australia and the other way around. So we're now looking at a whole population rather than just our small pool. And so the West Australian Vaccine Safety Surveillance has been established and I can now say with confidence based on this system that we've administered over 6,000 influenza vaccines in this year to young children in Western Australia. We've had five reports the vaccine safety surveillance system, they've all been looked at and we've had one febrile convulsion. So one in 6,000 doses administered, quite different than the one in 100 that we saw in 2010. I can also be confident to say that because we're now looking very hard at side effects following uh, influenza vaccination that the 50% fe uh, fever rate that we saw in 2010 is in subsequent years sorry, the colour hasn't worked very well, is now under 10%. So realistically in 2011, 12 and 13, we've been actively phoning families of children who received an influenza vaccination to say, well, did you have a temperature? Did you vomit? Did you have any shakes? And did you have any convulsions? And so I can be reassuring that the vaccine we're using in Western Australia in 2013 has a safety profile of what we'd normally expect for an influenza vaccine, not what we saw in 2010.
Unfortunately, there's a huge amount of information out there for young parents. I've got young children myself and lots of people come to me and say, well, what do I do? Well, there's so much information out there, it's hard to try and interpret that. So I've sort of thought about the five common clinical questions I get asked in my clinic and I wanted you to walk you through those. That's not complete. There'll be more questions and we're very happy to answer those. But the, what are the five common ones that people ask me? You can read them. So, with so many vaccines, are we overloading a child's immune system? I'd get asked that probably once a week. The chicken pox party question. I'll answer that for you. Well, if we vaccinate so many children, why do children still get disease? Well, I'll try and explain that to you. I'll talk about additives and I'll talk about autism. So, in a child's immune system, we have a huge amount of different cells all playing a very important role, all fitting together, working as a team to try and protect a child against infections and other things. Now, there are millions of cells and they are all able to respond to something new, whether that be a new bacteria or a new virus or something else that's not infectious. So any foreign protein or sugar body's immune system is able to respond to, and there's millions of cells that are able to do that. Importantly, the immune system can develop memory. So it may respond a little bit slowly initially. Next time it gets exposed, it responds a lot quicker and a lot quicker. So that's how we stay protected as we get older. What about overloading the child immune system? Every child, every day, gets exposed to hundreds of new things, new bits of bacteria, new bits of virus, new stuff from the sandpit, new stuff from daycare. You know, every day a child is exposed to new substances that the immune system needs to react to. So what about vaccines? Well, we have 15 vaccines that are administered to children routinely in Western Australia. And yes, there are a number of different antigens, proteins or carbohydrates in those vaccines. But if you look at the volume of that compared to what we used to use 30 years ago, where the vaccines were a lot less pure, less than the ones we use now, the actual volume of new things we're introducing into children is far smaller and also very small compared to what they're exposed to every day. Chicken pox party. Well, yes, you can go to a chicken pox party and it's likely your child will get chicken pox and they'll infect their brother and their sister and in subsequent, uh, uh, subsequent children in the family. Well, what about chicken pox party? My, my slides are disrupted there. But if you look at chicken pox, varicella, that one in 10 will get a significant bacterial infection requiring antibiotics. That one in 50 will get a lung infection. About one in 4,000 will get a brain infection from chicken pox and all families are disrupted from chicken pox. But vaccination, we can prevent 17 out of 20 cases of chicken pox and most of them are prevented from coming to hospital. So it's weighing up the risks. What about another example? Let's talk about measles. So pneumonia, a lung infection, about one in 16 will get a lung infection, often severe enough to land a child in hospital. About one in a hundred children will develop a febrile convulsion in the setting of measles and about a thousand, one in a thousand will get a brain infection, many of which will cause permanent damage. And estimated in Australia about one in five thousand will die of measles. Again, a vaccination program can prevent the vast majority of those. Now is it better to get natural infection? You may ask, well, sometimes the immunity from an infection is slightly stronger than the one that we get from vaccination. So maybe we need to do one or two doses as the situation with measles. If you've had measles before, you're likely to be protected against measles for the rest of your life. But we usually use two doses of vaccine to try and give you that level of protection. But again, it's balancing up the risks. Yes, you can go to a chicken pox party, but these are the risks of doing so. Well, why do some kids get disease despite us vaccinating? People think about vaccination as one thing. Every vaccine works in a slightly different way and the efficacy is slightly different for different vaccines. Why is that so? Well, everyone's immune system is slightly different. The strength and how long an immune response lasts varies from person to person. So not everyone's the same as far as their susceptibility. So realistically, everyone will respond in a different way and someone down the street may be more susceptible than your child. The bug's different as well. 
Some bacteria and viruses, I often tell my patients they're smarter than we are, they can modify themselves, they can evade. So influenza, classic example, it changes every year. It's staying ahead of us all the time. So we do need to modify our vaccine uh, to try and keep up with it. And so a vaccine is designed to produce the strongest immune response in the most people with the least amount of side effects. Now that's a line in the sand that you need to draw depending on how much you put in your vaccine. So trying to get that balance right is the key to vaccine design. What do we add to vaccines? Peter's already talked about things such as aluminium, so I'll touch on those. We often need to put preservatives or antibiotics into vaccines so they don't grow any bacteria during the transport and the storage of vaccines. We don't want that to occur, so it may contain a preservative or an antibiotic. Look up the internet and look up thiamersal. There's a huge amount of information. So thiamersal was a preservative that you, it was used in vaccines, still used in some vaccines, but it's not used in any vaccines available on the National Immunisation Program for Children in Australia. The volumes of thiamersal used in our current vaccines are smaller than the daily average consumption of mercury in many common foods. And the same goes for aluminium. Alum helps stimulate a stronger immune response. People will get worried about aluminium, but if you look at the amount of aluminium in a vaccine, it's less than a bowl of cornflakes. It's less than a daily dose of infant formula. So the amount of aluminium, yes, it's there, but it's absolutely tiny. What about things like formaldehyde? Formaldehyde can make you sick. Yes, it can in huge volumes, but it's actually part of the normal body's metabolism. We all produce formaldehyde and it has an essential role. The amount of formaldehyde that may be contained in vaccines is a fraction of what's actually circulating in the bloodstream every day in every child. So yes, there are things added to vaccines, but importantly, at quantities that are shown to be safe follow-up studies and importantly in volumes that are smaller than are present in things around us every day. Vaccines and autism. I'll take you through this story because I think it's important but it's also it's telling and gives us some insight about what we need to do as a community to try and protect our children. So autism is clearly something we want to avoid in children. About one in a hundred children are affected by autism. It usually presents in young children usually presents in the second or third year of life and it causes social difficulties, communication difficulties and behaviours and clearly something that we'd like to avoid. In the 90s, a group in the United Kingdom published on 12 cases, 12 children who presented in the second and third year of life who presented with gut symptoms and autism and it was put together that their gut symptoms were induced by the MMR vaccine which subsequently led to their autism and published in The Lancet. Now clearly this was a very big story and it had ramifications worldwide. MMR vaccine rates fell and I suspect a lot of what's happening in the United Kingdom at the moment is a result of that lower MMR vaccine rates across the board. What subsequently happened to this story? Well. It's since been revealed a number of the details within that first report were falsified and the lead author has been struck off from the medical board in the United Kingdom. But more importantly, other people have looked very, very hard. No one wants a vaccine that's associated with autism. Clearly it's something we need to avoid. The best study to my mind is the Danish study that looked at 500, nearly 440,000 children who were vaccinated and 95,000 children who weren't and looked at their rates of autism. No difference. Absolutely no difference in their autism rate associated with MMR vaccine. So I can be categoric, there is no evidence to link autism and measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Now you will have more questions and we will try and answer them for you. If we can't answer them in a group form, we're also very happy to answer them at other times as well. Um, and realistically, there is no silly question. So I'll probably hand back to Jonathan and uh, start answering some questions. All right, thank you, Chris. Look, um, we've got plenty of time now for some questions. I'll hand over to you. We've got to have um, someone wandering around with a microphone. There's Ebony up there. Um, so what we'll do is when you put your hand up, we'll get, uh, get you to wait a second until Ebony gets there. 
um, or Tammy up the back, just so that we can make sure everyone can hear. So, any questions? Okay, here we go. We've got a couple of people to kick us off. Okay. Uh, in terms of um, the preservatives and the additives that are added in, how you were saying that they're pretty safe, but with a vaccination, it's going into your bloodstream. When you consume those things, breathe them in in a normal environment, mm -hmm. it's going through a different um, pathway. So I'm just interested in how you can really tell the difference when using those to as comparison. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So, Chris, over to you. So, really, the additives question. The way we look at that is twofold. One, a number of the things have been present in vaccines for a long period of time, so we've got a long history of using. Sorry, can everyone hear up the back? Yes. Okay. Good. Shall I speak yes. louder? Yeah, speak louder anyway. <laughs> There's two ways of thinking of that. A number of the things that are present in vaccines have been used over a long period of time. Aluminium is one of those examples. We've got history back to the 1920s. Importantly, when they have been used in vaccines, large, large follow-up studies have been done to look for adverse reactions related to that. Yes, they have been done and they have not found any significant link to disease. Yes, uh, the volume in vaccine is incredibly small compared to what is around us all the time and often present within the body. So yes, other things are added to vaccines, however, at incredibly tiny volumes and importantly has an important role within that vaccine. We do not add things to vaccines just because we think it's a good idea. Each thing is put in has a very specific role and if it can be avoided, it would. I think your question about the fact that we're giving it straight into the body rather than into the, the gut through food, uh, don't underestimate the capacity of your intestines to absorb things. So, um, in fact, it's, it's, it's pretty minimal difference between the amount that's absorbed through your gut and through the injection for different substances. Was there another one next to you? Quite complex, um, and I know Dr Google probably hasn't helped either, but um, my question was about their immune response and food allergies. Last week, my seven and a half month old baby had an anaphylactic um, response to egg and today I had a skin um, test and he showed a larger response to peanut so I'm gathering he's going to be allergic to peanut as well. Um, is there any link with immunisations and food allergies? And I did read somewhere, Dr Google again, um, about peanut being or some traces of peanut being in immunisations as well as egg. So I think that Peter's the immunologist. Yep. So yeah, so I, I see a lot of children like yours today. I think it's important to, d to date that we have no evidence that vaccinations are linked to food allergy and obviously food allergy presents when children are first exposed to foods which current recommendations are six months so that's just after we've finished our immunisation schedule. So it is likely that most kids who have food allergy ha have been vaccinated but it doesn't mean it's causal. So just because it follows it doesn't mean it's caused by it. Um, I think that the we're still we're doing a lot of research in this area and we are looking at um, the role of infections in, in actually potentially protecting us from allergies and that's certainly a very active question that's being researched here at the Institute, looking at a, a whole bunch of different ways of, of looking at that. And it is probable that we do live in a much cleaner society than we used to and the immune system was probably used to dealing with a lot more infections and obviously some of those were vaccine preventable but in fact most of them haven't, we haven't changed the sorts of um, uh, infections that have come with clean hygiene, smaller family size, less contact between people. Um, and so that's a, so we, we don't think it's related to vaccines, but it is related to the immune system. And there's certainly, it may be that in fact in the future we'll be able to use vaccines to manipulate the immune system to decrease that risk of food allergy. Part of it is genetic, we know that. If you're a mum and you have an allergic disorder, your child is more likely to have allergies, but that wasn't the case 20 or 30 years ago. So we're, this hygiene hypothesis is certainly something that's been very actively researched and we're looking at very closely. But at the moment, none of the vaccines that we use have been specifically associated with allergy, but it is something that we're keeping a very close eye on. And in fact, we're doing a number of studies to look at those sorts of questions and, and have done so already. Can I add to that just to, that it's really important for you and for anyone who's got a child who has documented known allergies, particularly severe allergies that lead to you know, anaphylaxis, very severe reactions, that 
that you talk to your doctor in advance, that you're reassured. Absolutely, we need to be sure that any child who has a known allergy to a component of a vaccine <coughs> doesn't receive that vaccine. Now, most, um, most of the children who have some history of allergy can be safely immunised. Uh, they don't have allergies to what's in the vaccine. There are a couple of minor exceptions, but most of them, in fact, so for example, egg allergies um, are not a contraindication to the MMR vaccine. MMR vaccine doesn't contain traces of egg. It, it's made in chick embryo cells, which is why people make that connection. So that's been tested quite thoroughly and found to be safe. But there's also the capacity when there's genuine uncertainty or when a child really has such severe allergies um, that we just don't want them to be unsafe, to have them immunised in a very safe environment. So they can, if necessary, be even be brought into hospital for those first vaccines. Um, what we do want is to be able to offer vaccines to kids unless there's an absolute reason not to. And in most cases, we can. No. no. Not at all. Okay, any other questions? Okay, there's one up the back here, and then I'll come down to the front. I uh, just got a question in regarding the CSL vaccines that resulted in all the bad publicity a few years ago. I was just curious what stage, you mentioned the phases the vaccines go through, if it had actually been approved and if any of those high rates of incidents had been you know, detected in the earlier studies and I guess if there were any learnings or implications for future vaccines. I think there's a number of things that we can learn from that. Um, the CSL vaccine that was used in that specific year hadn't been used in previous trials, but previous CSL vaccines had been used. Data has emerged subsequent to the adverse events from some reports from a couple of years before showing higher rates of fever in a group of children who received a CSL vaccine compared to an alternative preparation in a sample of about 300 children. So yes, it probably is a vaccine specific thing as opposed to a year specific thing. Now these data were not available in 2010, but part of our mandate is to make sure that some of these safety data is available upfront for every new vaccine introduced and that's why we're doing some of the studies we're doing at the moment, so that we're not caught in this situation of emerging data after the event. Yeah. So keep in mind that the flu vaccine changes each year. Um, so there's a, there's a committee that meets every year and picks the three strains of flu that are in this year's vaccine based on all the information they can get. They, they pick the ones that are circulating or likely to be circulating that year. So not all flu viruses are the same. And in particular, the, what Chris outlined, in the way the flu vaccine, the way vaccines are prepared, the virus particles, if you like, are, it's called splitting. They're divided into smaller components so that they, are, they don't cause disease. And the, what appeared to happen that year was that the particular viruses that were in that year had um, a greater problem with not being split so well using the CSL methodology, which is why that one seemed to stand out. Down the front here. And my question is, if a child has one of the diseases you can vaccinate against, but hasn't been vaccinated, but has that disease and, and recovers from that disease, is that lifelong immunity or do they need to have a vaccination? Okay, so the, the, the answer to that is that it depends. Um, in most cases, for most diseases, if you get the natural infection, we know the immunity is very good. This, this is not the case for all diseases, but for most of them. The price you pay, of course, is that your child is, has had the disease. And in some cases, yes, if it's mild chickenpox and they've got better, that's great. But as we've heard, some cases don't uh, don't go that smoothly, they end up in hospital and some cases die or get brain inflammation. So yes it's true for most diseases, but not all, that getting the natural disease does give you better long-term immunity. Exceptions. Um, the HPV vaccine, the, 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 the cervical cancer vaccine, we know that in fact the vaccine induces much better immunity than if you're exposed to the, the protein of that, of that of, if you're exposed to that virus naturally. Um, we know that, for example, in young children under two, they don't develop a good immune response following infections with Hib, the, the disease I talked about, pneumococcus, meningococcus, because their immune systems are not able to respond as well to the 
the um, what's called the carbohydrates on the surface of that bug. And however, the vaccine, using really nifty techniques to essentially deceive the immune system into believing that this is a different type of antigen, if you like, a different type of molecule, the vaccine does induce good immunity in kids under two. So, and there are also examples where if you get a pneumococcal infection, you'll get, you'll get a potentially an immunity to that type of pneumococcus, but there's a whole lot out there. So it does depend, and I guess the message is that whilst it's true that natural immunity for most diseases is better if you get the disease rather than the vaccine, the risk is that your kid has to get the disease first and what's the potential outcome of that. And the vaccine still provi provides excellent long-term protective immunity. So that depends also. Peter? Yeah, I, I think this is a conversation. I think what we can say is that it's safe to give the vaccine, so you're not, and sometimes we run into situations, uh, probably the most common is whooping cough. So whooping cough has, we've just been through an epidemic, um, the whooping cough vaccine is actually part of a six-in-one vaccine that actually contains important, and in fact, it's very hard to find a vaccine without that whooping cough component. Um, so we actually do re recommend in those cases, children or babies that have had whooping cough should still get their, their subsequent booster immunisations, depending on where they are. If they haven't started, they should have their full immunisation series. But in fact, whooping cough is one of those situations that Jonathan talked about where even the natural infection doesn't give you lifelong immunity. It only gives you immunity to for five to ten years because of the nature of the infection and the fact that it's really in the back of the throat is where it causes most of its problems. So therefore, even if you've had whooping cough as a um, baby, then you still need boosters as an adult or if you're about to have your own children. So, so I think it is, it is a case-by-case -case scenario. And generally, where you have an infection that doesn't give you long lifelong immunity like whooping cough, the vaccine doesn't either. So there are some e exceptions like HPV where you might get better protection, but generally that's why we need to give boosters for some vaccines rather than others like measles where you get long-term protection from both the vaccines and the infection. But it is important. If you're not sure, it's best to go ahead and give the vaccine. And lots of parents have said, oh, I thought my child had chickenpox, and when you test them, the, the blood test shows they haven't had any immunity to chickenpox. Thanks. One down here. Yeah. Do you advise us of any updates on the HPV vaccine, how that's being rolled out to the year eight, nine and ten boys this year and any uh, reduction in rates of things such as genital warts, um, and any adverse effects? Um, myself and my friend work on the school immunisation team and we've been given lots of questions from parents and um, we just wondered if there's anything new that we should be telling them to... to um, to allay their fears or to promote the vaccine? Yep, I'll take that. My son actually had his HPV vaccine. Uh, actually, both my sons have had the HPV vaccine, but one of them this year. And there was a lot of discussion in the classroom about why we're we giving a cervical cancer vaccine to boys. It doesn't make sense. Um, the, the first thing to say is, that has it been safe? Yes, we've actually looked very close. And this is one of the newer vaccines that we've actually had very specific um, uh, mechanisms in place to look at that and the states have actually been reporting every week how many children have had problems. Boys aren't as tough as girls so we've had more kids fainting so that's <laughs> that's been one of the issues um, and so we've had to make sure that boys are in a safe position but in fact we haven't seen any side effects of uh, that have been significant other than sore arms it's quite a uh, it does cause some local reactions and is a bit of a painful vaccine and as I'm sure you might have heard and tend to, boys may not be as strong as they think they are sometimes. Um, um, but I think the other, the other issue is that it is important that we recognise that the vaccine we give does provide very high levels of protection against genital warts. So not only will these boys not pass on the cancer causing strains to their partners and there is a very small but, but very rare risk of, of cancers in boys as well from HPV strains that cause cervical cancer in women, but also it will protect them against um, genital warts. And a lot of people are surprised that the lifetime incidence before we introduced vaccines was about 10%. So the average uh, young adult had a 10% risk of acquiring genital warts at some stage during their um, life. So, um, but again, we're starting to see some benefits even before we start this program of herd immunity. So the rates of genital warts in um, sexually transmitted disease clinics around Australia is plummeting already from the vaccine that we introduced to uh, girls and young women six years ago. 
So, so HPV vaccine, I think, is one of the real success stories of, of recent vaccinations that we've introduced. And we're starting to see some of those benefits for the precancerous changes in women having pap smears. So it has been a very successful program, but um, you're right, a lot of people do worry about it. And I think we need to get that information out there as soon as possible and in a way that's easy for people to digest. And so this has been a, a good opportunity to demonstrate that. And that's one of the advantages of having large programs. You get that sort of information quite quickly. So I can be pretty confident in telling you that. I think I can see Paul Effler in the back. Is that you, Paul, up there? Um, did you want to update us on, on Paul's from the health department on the, the how the rollout's going and, you know, just who's getting it? Um, uh, yes, thanks for having me. The uh, uptake in boys has surprised me. We we're hearing back from the teams that it's about 70 to 80 percent of boys are uh, being consented by their parents to get it. And I frankly thought it was going to be higher in girls because it's been called the cervical cancer vaccine. But the the uptake's great, and we think the boys will get protected from warts, from rare anal cancers, and then also protect uh, female counterparts that might not have been able to be vaccinated. So it's a, a success so far, and I think will be an Australian success, success story. Uh, Chris, you want to say something? The vaccine is the first time we've taken the next step of preventing against uh, not an infection. We're trying to prevent against a malignancy. So a lot of the things we do have been vaccine preventable infections. And although cervical cancer starts as infection, the main reason to do it is because of cervical cancer. We will do this more and more. There are things that are coming online to try and prevent non-infectious diseases, um, whether that be cancers or other causes of illness. And this is something that we expect to come online more and more over the next decades. Keep in mind the hepatitis B vaccine that we use mm is also protecting against cancer. The greatest cause of death from hepatitis B is actually liver cancer in adults. Yeah. And so that's saving enormous numbers of lives. Yeah. Yes, one here. If the vaccines are given subcutaneous. Okay, subcutaneous. Mm. Um, we, we give some of our vaccines subcutaneously. Generally, actually, most vaccines don't go into, into the blood. They actually go into the muscle. Um, and that's because one of the things it does is it actually keeps the parts of the vaccine in the muscle and, it, and, and the antigens or the parts of the vaccine are actually released very slowly to the immune system. And so that's why we tend to get a better response generally if we get into the muscle and we don't get as much redness and swelling as if you give it subcutaneously. So that just means under the skin. Some vaccines we can give under the skin such as MMR or varicella and that's actually because they are, they are live viruses, so they will actually circulate in the system. So they do most of their action when they're circulating through the body about one, just one to two weeks after you get the vaccine. And so they are the ones we tend to give under the skin. But you can actually give any vaccine under the skin. You get a good response, not always as good. And certainly um, we don't give vaccines into the, uh, your backside anymore because there's a lot of fat there and actually fat's not very good for for uh, vaccinating so. into. <laughs> well, some of us, yeah. Uh, and, and, and so, but subcutaneously does work, but you are more likely to get reactions in terms of redness and swelling at that site. Yes. Hi, I was just wondering about the length of immunity that um, vaccinations provide. If it's, uh, you know, chicken pox one, is it seven years? Is it lifelong? And because and, I've heard about booster programs and that sort of thing. And I'm also considering, you know, there has been a, a significant smear campaign against parents who aren't getting, the, choosing not to get their kids vaccinated in the media. You know, they use lots of emotional language to do with it. But a lot of my friends that I know haven't had boosters themselves. So I'm just wondering, is that a case of the pot calling the kettle black? And you know, how do we deal with that in society? Probably to answer the second part first. The vast majority of parents who don't immunise their children is not because they choose not to. It's because they're busy families. It's got two, three children, they've got school, they've got this, they've got that. It's really hard, but importantly, um, it's not because most people are not choosing to vaccinate. How long does a vaccine last? Again, it's a bit of a depends on the vaccine. Uh, you know, for example, MMR, two doses, is expected to give lifelong protection. So we expect that to last a very long time. Pertussis, whooping cough, probably five years, uh, maybe a little bit longer. Right? So it's quite different. And a good example is something like the chickenpox vaccine. 
So for example, in a situation where there's chicken pox in the community, where your body's being constantly exposed to chicken pox and tickling your immune system all the time, you probably maintain your immunity to chicken pox after one dose. But we may, in the future, with less chicken pox in the community, not have that tickling effect, so people's immunity may wane. The only way we're going to be able to sort that out is by look at, looking at the population, seeing what their immunity levels is after one dose over time and seeing whether we need to introduce a booster vaccination program. And we may need to do that. Um, and that research is being done at the moment. And I think the, uh, your, I mean your, your question is an excellent one and it's, it kind of goes to the heart of what a lot of parents are concerned about. They're just not sure. There's so much information around about vaccines. There's so many stories and very personal stories, often very tragic stories. Um, and I guess one of the key things about the, the stories is that uh, for most cases, not all of them, for most cases there are stories of children who've got awful conditions, whether it's severe autism, whether it's brain damage. Um, there's a range of conditions that have been linked potentially to immunisation. You've got to remember that we immunise every kid. Well, 90% of kids in this state, they get a number of vaccines. Things happen to kids that we don't have a clear explanation for, especially immune-mediated diseases. That means there's always going to be someone who develops one of these diseases shortly after getting a vaccine. And it's only through the sort of research that we heard around the measles, mumps, rubella, autism link that we can actually, we can, un we can sift out whether or not something bad that's occurred after a vaccine is due to that vaccine or whether it was something that was just going to happen anyway. But we understand that this is really important and that's why we try and present the science, try and give people confidence uh, and I think the, what's happened since the CSL flu vaccine story is, a, is one where, where I think we can have a lot more confidence and we're learning all the time. Nothing is perfect. There are risks with everything. There are risks for crossing the road, we know that. You go to your doctor, you get a, an infection, in, your kid has an infection in their ear, they'll write a prescription for antibiotics. Chances are you're going to give that antibiotic to your child. The risk of your child having a severe reaction to that antibiotic is a lot more than the risk of having a severe reaction to any vaccine. But you, you trust, you know there's a, there's a risk and there's a benefit. And I suppose what we want people to do is to understand the benefits. We want to understand that the risks are very minimal, but the risks are not nothing. There is always a risk. Um, and that we're trying to do everything we can to minimise that risk to keep an eye on things, to improve outcomes and to make things safer and safer. Um, then for the individual parent, I guess the last thing I would usually say to them when, when they come and see me about this is just imagine if your child got the disease that you chose not to immunise against and it caused them to have severe brain damage, it killed them, how would you feel? And the chance of that happening if you choose not to immunise your child is a heck of a lot more than the incredibly unlikely chance they'll get a severe reaction to a vaccine. Um, so in the end, it's a very personal decision. It's about you, everyone wants to do the best thing by their kid, and we understand that. And so what we're trying to do here is give you the information so you can, you can make an informed decision. And in the end, parents make informed decisions. We're not forcing kids to be immunised. Peter. I mean, I think the other point you raised is about whose responsibility is it as well. And, and, and I think that's really important and I think as a community it's important for us to say well look we think this is important because I've been affected and there's people in this audience who I know have had been affected by now what are now vaccine preventable diseases so I think that's really important I think as doctors and nurses it's important that they are up to date with the latest information there is an avalanche of information out there we've heard about Dr Google he's, he's got a better memory than any any doctor or nurse you're going to see so everyone has access to that information now what we need to provide people with is a context around that. And I think one of the real strengths we have is here is that we have some of the best autism researchers in the world. We have some of the best allergy researchers. So when the issue about, well, what's this, is there links between vaccines and allergy? We can say, well, we're going to work together. We're going to, we're going to look at this in a research project and try and answer that question. And I think that's really important. And then we need to get that evidence out there. And we've done that with the MMR um, that question that Chris said about overloading the immune system and that was one of the um, hypotheses that the group in London put together. Well we actually showed that we compared children who had MMR and who didn't and we looked at the development of their immune system over a period of months with 
uh, Pat Holt, who was working on immune development and allergy here at the Institute, and we showed there was no effect. So we can answer those very specific questions, but I think, it, I th I think we do need to get onto this point. This is, this is, everyone's, this is everyone's business, okay? And, and so the more support we have in the community for things like immunisation and other really important public health measure, measures, the better everyone's life will be. And so I think that is something we can do. But as Jonathan said, this is still a personal choice at the end of the day. And I think in, when I was a bit younger and I used to see a, uh, a lot of people who had issues around vaccination, I used to get a bit cross at the end of the, when they didn't leave. They came in with 300 pages, they printed off the internet and they said, Dr Richmond, haven't you read all this? This is really important and it was what I would label poor quality evidence. Um, now I, I'm much more, well okay, I can understand that. This is the information that I think you should have a look at and this is something you can do that might get your child immunised. And so sometimes we strike a bit of a deal. You know, you're completely unimmunised, let's start with this vaccine, get your confidence up, you know about this disease, okay, your child's fine now, and, and often they'll actually get completely immunised. So I think it is about working in partnerships with parents not being experts here who say, we know everything, you know nothing, go and do it. We're in a different society now, and I think a better one for that. All right, look, um, it's well after 7.30, well not well after, a bit after 7.30, um, so I'm going to call a halt there. A couple of things I want to say, um, one of which is my own experience with flu vaccine. I get my kids immunised with flu vaccine every year. They have asthma. Uh, it's very important for me to do that. Last year, the, we were living interstate. The flu season arrived early, literally two days before we scheduled our child to go and get the flu vaccine. She got sick. She was in hospital for five days. She had severe pneumonia. And I can tell you this year, it was a lot easier for our kids to get their flu vaccine. They were saying, okay, Dad, I don't want to do that again. So um, there, are, there are personal stories that we've all got that I think we can share. Um, I also think it's really important to point out or to reiterate that there are no silly questions and I think tonight's questions have been terrific and we're very happy to continue that dialogue whether it's through the email or through us talking individually or through you coming to see us in the clinics, whatever. I think it's really important that we stay open and it's, it's all about having the honest discussion and we want to hear all sides of the argument. And to be honest that's what a research institute should be doing. We're here to try and understand the truth, but to also understand it in a way that's relevant. And we want to make sure we do this sort of thing more. Uh, and to that end, as you leave, there are these little forms with a blue on them and the little feet. Um, this is a feedback form, and we want to do more of these public seminars. And this is your chance to tell us what you think we should do seminars about. So grab one of these, um, give us the feedback about whatever you think we should talk about, what you've got questions about, and we'll, we'll respond to it. Um, so please, as you leave, do that. As I said, there are copies of this um, questions and answers book. It's a really terrific book, and, as, and you can just log on to the Academy of Science website to download it. Um, it just remains for me to thank um, the wonderful communications and PR team here at the Institute who've done all the background work organising this. Um, particularly to thank Chris and Peter for their participation, but particularly, look, thank you for coming, thank you for listening, thank you for the wonderful questions, and uh, please spread the word. We want more and more people in the community to know that we're, we're much more open for business. We really want to talk a lot more with people about what bothers them and how that can influence both how we do our work and how we respond to the community's needs. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.